Chapter 1261 Ice Giant Descendant Ice creatures continued to swarm forward with no regard for their own lives. However, their courage and fearlessness were like pretty bubbles in the face of absolute power, crushed with a single touch. A new wave of native creatures charged forward and turned into dust. Another wave of native creatures rushed forward and was crushed to pieces. The one standing at the front of the five-person party was no longer Green, but Sand King. Sand King wasn't quite unleashing any of his powers, either. He simply walked forward with his thundering steps, crushing all the monsters he came across like a heavy tank. Sand King might have seemed smaller than some of those magical creatures some of whom stood up to dozens of meters tall, but his terrifying control over sand constantly shrouded him in a sandstorm. Any creature that walked into the sandstorm was quickly shredded and torn into pieces. When Sand King walked by, all that would be left behind him were his strange footsteps and large pools of blood. As for the ice breaths, ice spears, and snowballs that the native creatures fired at him while at death's door. They shattered into tiny pieces of ice against Sand King's impenetrable carapace. Their attacks could not leave anything on his giant body apart from a few spots of frost here and there. Initially, only apprentice-level creatures attacked the party. However, as the party continued to push forward and entered within 50 kilometers of the snowy plains, the number of native creatures attacking them had increased in power level. The apprentice-level snow worms, the beginner first-grade crystal monsters, the intermediate first-grade frost demons, the advanced first-grade snow apes, the beginner second-grade ice abominations, and the advanced second-grade frost wraiths. These plains, the glacier plains, were clearly a fairly resource-rich area in chill frost. The attacks against the party had barely stopped since they started their journey. They were continually being attacked by packs of monsters or ambushed by individual predators. In all honesty, these native creatures were quite vicious and savage indeed. However, when their opponents were top-class powerhouses from other planes, their ice powers and insignificant physical prowess appeared to be laughable. It didn't matter what they tried. Hiding under a thick pile of snow, ambushing along the party's path, or even summoning a blizzard to conceal their presence, no amount of fancy technique would help if they did not have the corresponding power to deal with these enemies. They came, and they stayed forever. Reduced to ice shards and returned to the planar origin. Tens of thousands of ice creatures paid with their lives as the price, but they could not even leave a single scratch on the enemy party members. The difference in power was too vast. It was so huge that there was no way to make up for it with numbers or tactics. The party still continued forward at a leisurely pace. Of course, if it was necessary, the party could easily traverse the 500-kilometer distance in the blink of an eye and arrive at the ice dragon's lair. However, since they had only just arrived, they were still suffering from severe planar suppression. That was why the party intentionally delayed their progress, wiping out the local population as they waited for the effects of the suppression to ease up. Spellcasters relied on their analysis of the local planar laws to reduce the suppression to themselves. Meanwhile, physical fighters like Sand King relied on the powerful adaptability of their bodies. Their ability to decipher the planar laws was mediocre but their ability to adjust their bodies and adapt to a new planar environment was incredible. As such, the party members were not in a hurry. They continued on their steady pace, slowly approaching their target destination one step at a time. In truth, Kanganas and the others also hoped the ice dragon would succumb to the planar influence and charge out of its lair to challenge them. After all, that would take away some degree of the dragon's geographical advantage. The act of breaking into the lair of a thousand-year-zero-old ice dragon was undoubtedly filled with tremendous risk. However, the chances of the dragon charging out of its lair were very, very minute. No ruler would ever emerge from their hiding spot and fight against multiple enemies of the same grade over some insignificant civilians. Three days later, after crossing the glacier plains and making it past the deep freeze valley, the party finally arrived at their destination. 
all the mountainous, hazardous, and steep snow peaks could no longer be seen here. Everything within sight appeared to be completely flat. The ground was also covered in a thick sheet of ice, a dozen meters thick. Meanwhile, a chilly sea flowed slowly beneath the ice, occasionally letting out chilling winds into the air. The depth of this sea was immeasurable. Despite their powerful spirits, none of the party members were able to sense the bottom of the sea. There were no signs of life in this location. Even the cold wind seemed to betray a hint of desolation and death as it blew past. However, a colossal block of ice stood at the center of this frozen sea. The ice peak reached beyond the dark clouds, making it difficult to see what was at the top. It knows we're here. It was Kanganas who spoke. His crimson soul fire flickered in his skull, projecting a chilling aura far colder than even the cold winds of this foreign world. I can sense its power rising. The rest of the party did not say anything. They were all using their own techniques to sense the presence of the terrifying creature on top of that snowy peak. Grim lifted his head. A red beam shot out of his blazing eyes towards the peak. He could vaguely see something through those dense clouds. A majestic palace seemed to stand upon the peak and between the clouds. Just as Grim attempted to get a better look, the clouds were disturbed, and his vision was disrupted. Everything became shrouded in mystery once more. Chip, conduct a self-assessment. What is my condition right now? Beep. Self-assessment complete. Green. Mail. Fourth grade SEMA principal adept, fire specialization. Chaos physique, excellent magic resistance. Star beast bloodline, 15%. Heart of Principles, 76% Mastery of Fire Laws. Bodily Attributes, Strength 27, Physique 31 plus 2, Agility 19, Spirit 44 plus 5. Bloodline Talent, Energy Black Hole. Fire Laws, Increased Fire Range, Locked In, Fire Penetration, Locked In, Invisible Flames, Locked In, Fires Blast, Locked In. Host is currently experiencing planar suppression. Chill Frost Planar Law Analysis Progress, 100%. Host's power has been suppressed to begin a fourth grade. Host currently has 82% of full power. Elementum power is 76% as effective as usual. Effectiveness of fire laws is not compromised. Green read the data provided by the chip and was speechless. Even with the help of the chip and a complete analysis of the planar suppression, he had only managed to recover 82% of his usual power. His companions were most certainly more affected than he was. How well could they fight still? However, the degree to which everyone had recovered their powers was an incredibly private secret. If this information was leaked, it would be very easy for an opponent to deduce their spirit strength. Even though they were in a party, there was no way they could share such information. This is the entrance to the ice dragon's lair, Kangana's spirit was getting restless now that they were here. A little further, and we will be entering the settlement of the ice giants that the ice dragon has enslaved. Ice giants? Grim said in surprise. Didn't the ancient ice giants go extinct? How could there possibly be ice giants here? KKK he, ancient ice giants are powerful existences of sixth grade and above. There's no way a mere fourth grade ice dragon could enslave them. Kanganas laughed sinisterly and explained, the ice giants here are only mutts that have inherited some degree of the ice giants bloodline. Even so, there are quite a few individuals among them who have reached third and fourth grade. They are not easy opponents at all. He he he. Cannon fodder. If you think this is trouble, then I can deal with all of them alone. Of course, I will take most of their spoils for myself. Sand King chuckled with his booming voice. HMPH. You wish. Sheena flicked her slender tongue as she coldly said, We will strike together, and we must be clean. 
Don't let these giants disrupt our plans. Everyone else nodded and said nothing else. Together, they stepped onto the sheet of ice above the frozen sea. They did not make it a hundred meters across the ice before they stopped and looked around them. Several giant pillars of ice had abruptly burst up around them. Several towering and ferocious giants walked out from within the ice. These giants had blue skin that almost seemed translucent. You could see their bones and blood, all of a slightly darker shade of blue. There were males and females amongst the giants, all of them covered in crude, simple garments made out of animal skin. The giants stood at an average of 12 meters tall. The male giants looked more muscular and were bald. Their eyes were so white it seemed like a terrifying snowstorm was brewing within. The female giants were more petite, and they had strange hair behind their heads that seemed to be woven out of icicles. Without exception, all of them had the infamous strength that all giants possessed. They also had shocking ice powers. Seventeen ancient ice giant descendants, the leader of whom had the powers of a beginner fourth grade. The rest of the giants were also at third grade. Even the two giants that looked like children had the power of an intermediate second grade. Stop there, outsiders! The leader of the giants had a loud voice. When he shouted, the sea beneath them seemed to roar alongside him. The ice around him also cracked and erupted. This is the territory of the great ice dragon Nax. You may not enter without permission. TCA. What age is it? To think that there are still people that like to announce their names before they got to the fighting. Grim insulted the giants in his mind and held out the massive fire spell he had been preparing, without any mercy at all. Scarlet Firestorm. Chapter 1262 Shadow Demon Appears. The battle started abruptly and ended even faster. All the party members had experienced dealing with powerful, brawny enemies with some degree of magical power and no high-grade magical equipment. Scarlet Firestorm. Ripple of Death. Petrification Beam. Earth Tremor. Void Overflow. The one dozen ice giants surrounding them were knocked flat onto the ground instantly, their formation scattered and in ruins. The force fields of the weaker giants shattered immediately. Their bodies were then swarmed with strange energy of various colors, red, white, and gray. They screamed in agony and collapsed. Only the three strongest ice giants managed to endure the attacks. They roared as chilling winds engulfed them. They lifted a hand and began hurling massive ice spikes at Green and the rest of the party. These ice spikes were an entire meter in diameter, each one of them containing freezing cold that could kill any creature in a single strike. Even the fourth grade invaders would have trouble dispelling the cold if caught in it, let alone an ordinary mortal. The reason the ancient ice giants were so powerful was because of their absolute control over the cold. The adepts called it principal powers, while the giants, who were the embodiment of the universe's will, called it origin. It didn't matter what this power was called, anyone that could master a specific power to the extreme and control it with finesse would be a powerful opponent. However, the principal powers were the cause of both the rise and fall of the ancient ice giants. The ancient ice giants were born in accordance with the will of the universe. They were incredibly strong, and the ice powers they possessed was enough to wipe out anyone who made an enemy out of them. That was why they managed to make a name for themselves in ancient times, establishing themselves as figures of respect and fear for countless mortal worlds. However, as the will of the universe shifted, the titans came into existence, and the various giant tribes gradually fell into decline. The moment the ice giant's forces started to weaken, they were attacked by countless rising tribes and species. Thus, the bloodline of the ancient ice giants came to an end. Only remnants of their bloodline remained in certain remote worlds. These ice giant descendants did not have the terrifying might of the ancient ice giants. They were either physically incompetent or possessed limited control over their ice powers. In conclusion, they might seem like fourth-grade creatures, 
but their true powers were a far cry from their bloodline source. A single round of attacks had managed to knock out most of the ice giants. Sand King alone was enough to deal with the three remaining giants. Sand King possessed an unusual ability to travel through the ground. He vanished from the spot, digging into the ice, just in time to dodge the desperate retaliation of the ice giants. When he once again appeared, he was right beneath the three giants. The ground quaked, and the ice splintered as Sand King's giant body burst forth from below. The three ice giants were thrown into the air. As they panicked and scrambled to react, Sand King reached with his two pincers and cut the two advanced third-grade ice giants in half with a single snap. He then smashed the fourth-grade ice giant into the ground with his head. His stinger lunged forward and stabbed the giant in the chest, injecting fearsome venom into his body. The leader of the ice giants was truly a fourth-grade creature. It did not die, even after being so severely injured. Instead, it let out a furious roar and grabbed Sand King's pincers with his arms. He then opened his mouth as wide as it could go, attempting to let out a breath of the strongest ice power he could muster. Frightening ice power gathered in the giant's throat. The color was faint, almost a translucent white, but the ice laws contained within the breath made everyone in the party frown. The bloodline of the ice giants might have been in decline, but this terrifying attack that drew upon all of the giant's blood essence was a massive threat to a fourth-grade powerhouse. Sand King immediately started struggling with all he had. His pincers started to crush down on the ice giant's arms, causing the giant's bones to creak and splinter. The stinger in the giant's chest started to move around wildly, making a mess of his chest cavity. Unfortunately, it wasn't so easy to escape the last desperate attack of the ice giant. The ice giant leader had clearly made up his mind to fight to the very end. Even as injured as he was, he would rather die than stop his attack. An ordinary party would have attempted to save Sand King, if only to ensure he could continue fighting as their meat shield. However, this party was composed entirely of wanderers and individuals of the evil alignment. No one would be willing to risk danger just to save a teammate. However, there were always exceptions. Just as the ice giant's ice power peaked, a dark, towering figure gleaming with a metallic sheen emerged from the giant's shadow. The sharp metal blades in its hand stabbed the giant through its head. Shadow power surged forward, instantly crushing his brain and consciousness. The ice power finally went berserk at the peak of its might. The ice power should have been controlled by the ice giant. Instead of blasting completely towards Sand King, it erupted as a halo of ice in every direction. The world seemed to lose all its color where the ice power passed. Every substance lost its original color as it was sealed under a solid layer of ice. A short moment later, the ice exploded, causing everything frozen in the ice to shatter in tiny, white shards. No creature could possibly have survived such conditions. However, there were always exceptions. Two ferocious figures broke free of the ice, shrugging off pieces of ice as they charged out of the explosion. Sand King's once golden body was now covered in frost. He shook his body furiously as he ran away, casting down shards of ice to the ground. Once the frost was all gone, Sand King appeared untouched, as if he had not been injured at all. However, everyone in the party could clearly sense that Sand King's violent, earth-yellow origin powers were now stained with a white trace. He had been affected, after all. However, everyone's gaze lingered on Sand King for only a brief moment. Their attention then shifted to the metal golem. A fourth grade golem. Everyone's gaze turned cold. Grim chuckled and explained, I am a spellcaster. Melee combat is not my proficiency. It's very logical to bring a metal golem at my side. Having said that, Grim accepted a red crystal and a drop of blood that Shadow Demon passed to him. He weighed it in his hand and smiled as he said, Sand King, since I helped you out so much, you won't mind if I take some of the materials, do you? 
I don't mind at all, in fact, I have to thank you for helping me there. Otherwise, I would have been badly injured. Sand King shook his massive body and glanced at Green with his green eyes. The metal golem shook its body and cast off the thick shell of ice on its back. It then turned into shadow once again and slowly merged with Green's shadow. Its assimilation with Green's shadow had been flawless, so much so that the other party members did not even detect its presence. However, that undispellable surge of ice power had stained Shadow Demon's shadow powers, making it possible to sense its existence now. The other party members put on a forced smile, but in truth, they were more cautious around Green now. In particular, the other spellcasters were shocked. Even their movements became unnatural. What were spellcasters most afraid of? Of course, it was those stealthy assassins. It was only natural that they would put up their guards now that they knew Grim had brought with him such a stealthy and powerful golem. It was fortunate that Shadow Demon had been contaminated with a trace of ice powers, allowing them to track its movements. However, none of them would dare to let a fourth-grade shadow golem move freely around them. After taking out all the ice giants, the party stopped to harvest their corpses for materials. High-grade bloodline materials like these were hard to come by. To let them slip by would be a disgrace to the name of the ancient ice giants. Everyone worked on harvesting the corpses. Soon, the ice giant corpses were all split up between the party. Giants might be powerful, intelligent beings in the eyes of mortals, but they were only moving materials and resources in the eyes of these evil beings. The party made it across the ice giant's territory, crossing several kilometers of ice, before arriving at that giant ice cliff that reached into the clouds. Everyone exchanged looks when they saw this sheer, icy cliff. They then took to the sky and slowly flew upwards against the wall of ice. The closer they got to the peak, the more they could sense the desolation and chill surrounding that space. The group could not sense any signs of life here. The only thing they could feel was that subtle fear from the depths of their soul. The ancient reliquary of deep winter, there was no doubt it was here. However, its aura had been concealed by a more powerful soul flux. Everyone cautiously passed through the cloud layer at the middle of the ice cliff. They then flew for another half an hour before reaching the peak. This place was a broad platform, several square kilometers in size. A majestic palace of ice stood at the very center. The entire palace was not built with a single piece of wood, but crystalline blocks of ice. A hundred ice pillars filled with intricate carvings and mysterious patterns supported the palace. A strange dragon crouched on a tall platform at the back of the palace. When it sensed the arrival of unfamiliar auras, it lifted its head lazily and evaluated its uninvited guests. Ice Dragon So this was the so-called Ice Dragon. Chapter 1263 Skeletal Ice Dragon Nax This dragon was unusual. Even though it had the body and appearance of a skeletal dragon, its insides were very different. The gaps between the bones, its chest cavity, and the tiny holes in its bare, leather wings were filled with blue, bone-chilling ice energy. Crystalline frost covered the surface of the bones. Strangely enough, it did not seem to affect the dragon, as if the ice did not exist at all. The ferocity of the dragon, combined with the unstoppable seeping force of ice, gave rise to this horrifying monstrosity. Why is it an undead dragon? Green frowned, I'm certain ice dragons are also creatures of flesh and blood. Where is its flesh? Green might now have seen any fourth-grade ice dragons back in Lance, but he had killed several first- and second-grade ice dragons. All of those ice dragons, without exception, were living creatures. None of them were undead. This is just evidence that the ancient reliquary is in its possession. Kangana's crimson soul fire cut through the distance and landed on the ice dragon crouching within the palace. He explained in a cold voice, it might have once been a dragon with blood and flesh, but after such a long time exposed to the ancient reliquary, its flesh must have been corroded away. 
Don't forget, the ancient reliquary of deep winter contains the laws of death and ice. Grim instantly understood the situation after hearing the liquor's explanation. As expected, there were always two sides to a coin. This ice dragon coveted the ice laws in the ancient reliquary. However, if it absorbed the powers within the reliquary, its flesh would unavoidably be destroyed by the death laws within. Those were high-grade death laws. The corroded tissue could not possibly regenerate through sheer physical powers. The powers of death had thoroughly modified this ice dragon. It was a skeletal ice dragon with the law powers of both ice and death. It was now an undead dragon from head to toe. Insignificant, greedy invaders. I smell the howls of resentful wraiths on you souls of my subordinates, of the residents of my kingdom of ice. Your actions will be punished by fate. I will seal you in ice and place you in front of the palace entrance to warn all who come after. The skeletal ice dragon raised its upper body, and its blue leather wings flared open. Strange runes glowing with bright light and a dense cloud of ice energy surrounded its body. From a distance, the dragon looked like an intricate sculpture of ice. HMPH. Big words for a mere dragon. Kanganas couldn't help but mock the dragon. If I'm not wrong, you must be trying to merge the ancient reliquary with your soul, aren't you? You bastards. I knew it. You are here for the reliquary, the skeletal dragon roared as clouds of frost surged out of its mouth, causing the temperature in the palace to fall by a hundred degrees or so. The ancient reliquary of deep winter contains death laws and ice laws. You are trying to assimilate the reliquary with your soul to advance to fifth grade. You underestimated its power and overestimated yourself. You were even willing to turn yourself into an undead just to make the assimilation succeed. KKK he. Quite decisive, I see. The lick coldly continued, now that we're here, best recognize your situation. Hand it over. Or else. Perhaps infuriated by the licker's words, the dragon roared and crouched down. It charged towards the party with thundering steps. Sand King, Medusa, stop it! Kangana's sharp voice rang out in the hall. Meanwhile, he took a few steps back and quickly started chanting the spell to open a rift to his undead dimension. Damn it! This beast is too big! Sand King shouted furiously. I can only stop it for around twelve seconds. You guys had better pick up the slack after that. Having said that, Sand King shook his body as he instantly extracted a large amount of sand and dirt from beneath the ice. The sand merged into his body. His insectoid body had only been five meters long, but it instantly started swelling. In the blink of an eye, he had turned into a scorpion about twelve meters long. Sand King immediately charged at the skeletal ice dragon. The dragon's tail alone was 35 meters long. It was several times larger than Sand King. The collision of the two titans was like the crash of a comet against a planet. A violent storm instantly appeared at the center of the palace. Several of the closest ice pillars were blown to ice shard fragments by the rippling shockwave and blasted into the distance. Sheena, who was lighter in weight, was blown back by the winds. She had to curl her tail around a pillar to stabilize herself. Meanwhile, Tula's the star spirit reacted unusually. Three strange shields glowing with a dark light appeared around him before he crouched against the ice. Several strange runes flew out of his body. These runes seemed to possess incomprehensible and weird powers. They flew towards the flash of blue in the center of the storm. Green was also casting his spells quickly. As his voice started to rise in pitch, a massive door forged entirely out of flames appeared and opened wide. The next moment, a tide of fire creatures rushed forward and charged towards the ice dragon at Grim's command. All right, my turn. At almost the same instant, Kanganas managed to open his undead dimension. A skeletal door appeared out of thin air. As it opened, 
an elite army of undead marched out from within in an orderly fashion. At the very front of the army was a horde of two hundred fearsome gowls. These creatures had no skin only slime above their exposed muscle fibers. They crouched over the ground like hounds, white bone spikes growing out of their spines. Their primary weapons were their sharp, clawed limbs, as well as their vicious teeth and extendable tongues. A dozen lesser leeches stood behind the gowls, dressed in grey robes and holding bone staves in their hands. They were natural undead spellcasters, capable of casting most death magic and several fearsome soul curses. Flanking the formation of lesser leeches was thirty undead knights. There were all sorts of undead knights amongst them, from the weakest skeletal knights, first grade, to the most powerful scourge knights. However, even they weren't the most potent forces in Kangana's undead army. As the elite undead continued to swarm forward, the sound of rattling bones could be heard. A gigantic bone dragon, measuring fifteen meters in length, appeared in the palace. Army of the dead, dispose of this fool for me. Lit Kangana's waved his staff, and all the undead lifted their heads and let out a battle cry. They stormed towards the dragon from its flank. Fire creatures, undead creatures, void runes. The three spellcasters unleashed their powers, instantly summoning a terrifying army that charged towards the fight from every direction. Meanwhile, Sand King was beginning to falter. The gigantified body he created using his innate powers was not an actual physical body, after all. Sand King still had to endure the difference in strength caused by the massive size difference with every clash against the skeletal ice dragon. The dragon's body had been forged harder than steel by the powers of ice. Apart from a few flakes of frost and ice falling off its body during the fight, it did not seem to be injured. Meanwhile, Sand King was already covered in injuries. Cracks could be seen everywhere on his carapace, and his insectoid blood was frozen into ice before it could even hit the ground. Sheena moved around the battle with her agile body, occasionally scaling the ice pillars and attacking the ice dragon with her vicious snake arrows. Sheena had six arms. Two of them slashed the ice crystals aimed at her to pieces, while another two pulled the bow and shot out strange snake arrows. These snake arrows came from her hair of snakes. Every time a snake arrows hit an enemy in addition to the impact of the arrow itself, the arrows would instantly turn into vicious poison snakes that coiled around the opponent. It was Sheena's most powerful long-range attack. However, her attacks were virtually ineffective against skeletal ice dragon Naks. Those snake arrows couldn't even penetrate the thick layer of ice on Naks's bones. After turning into snakes, the arrows would freeze into little sculptures before they could do anything. The difference in their sizes also made Sheena fearful of approaching the dragon. If she were hit directly by the dragon's extreme ice powers, she would not be able to come out unscathed. She did not have Sand King's tough carapace or his ferocious strength to break free of the ice. In all honesty, it was simply too difficult fighting against this skeletal ice dragon. Sand King's every movement was reduced to a crawl while he was within the radius of Naxa's frost halo. His insectoid limbs would be frozen to the ground if he stopped for even the briefest of moments. He had to rely on his overwhelming strength to crush the ice before he could move again. After holding on for thirteen painful seconds, Sand King had no choice but to retreat from the battlefield. The moment he stepped away, the large horde of fire creatures, undead, and void runes immediately surrounded the dragon. The skeletal ice dragon, Nax, roared in anger when it saw enemies swarming in from every direction. It opened its maw and let out a giant breath of frost. Every single creature in the charge, undead or fire creature, was instantly encased in a thick layer of translucent ice. As the frost dissipated, the ice crystals shattered, and every creature sealed within broke into pieces. Chapter 1260 For the Forest of Ice Clusters and the Mist of Ice Frost Breath Incomparably pure and powerful. The breath attack contained no other elementium or physical effect apart from the extreme, bone-chilling cold. 
that was enough to deal with mortal enemies. A frost breath was no more than a single attribute elementium attack, after all, Green had seen plenty of similar attacks. It didn't matter if it was an all-out attack from a second-grade ice dragon or a fourth-grade ice giant's desperate retaliation. The effects of a breath attack might differ, but the attack's power would always remain within the limits of the planar laws. However, this frost breath was clearly beyond the limits of fourth grade. It was approaching the power of the gods. Indeed, the power of the gods. Gods were higher beings with terrifying powers beyond what was possible for mortals. They were individuals that had transcended the limitations of the planar laws. Divine spells driven by divine power were naturally tens, even hundreds, of times more potent than ordinary magic. While Naxa's frost breath didn't cover an exceptionally wide area, it was incredibly powerful. It contained traces of the laws of ice that an ordinary person couldn't hope to survive. It didn't matter if you were a colossal giant, a lightning-fast assassin, or a spellcaster protected under layers of magical defenses. As long as some form of law power did not protect you, you would not be able to resist the ice law's corrosion and destruction. The low-grade fire creatures and gals were encased in ice before they could struggle in any manner. The ice then shattered, and the creatures along with it. The entire ground was littered with pale, frost-covered corpses. There were no bloodstains or cries of agony, only a lingering aura of cold. The more powerful undead knights and fire creatures were able to struggle for a while in the ice. However, they did not have the ability to resist the ice laws, they also splintered into tiny shards as the ice broke apart. The undead knights had not actually died, despite having splintered into countless pieces. They were still struggling and trying to break free of the frost to put their bodies back together. Meanwhile, as the fire creatures shattered, their blazing bodies vanished, leaving only smoldering fire cores on the ground. These fire cores were still burning under the frost, trying to melt the ice with their flames' heat, such that the fire creatures could regenerate their bodies. A mighty army comprising 2,000 fire creatures and elite undead crumbled under a single frost breath and vanished without a trace. At a single glance, there were less than ten creatures who were still alive and with intact bodies. It was an absolute massacre. However, skeletal ice dragon Nax seemed to have been affected by the use of its breath. The frost that covered its skeletal body was slightly thinner now. It seemed like such a large-scale attack proved to be a tremendous burden on it as well. On the edge of the battlefield, several explosions rang out. Ice erupted, and cold air seeped outward. Grim, Kanganas, and Chulas broke free of their ice encasements and appeared in the palace once more. Sand King had already burrowed underground, avoiding the terrifying attack altogether. Meanwhile, Medusa Sheena had been frozen solid on an ice pillar by the frost breath. She could not move a single inch and remained still, like a sculpture of ice. She did not have Sand King's overwhelming strength that could allow her to break free of the ice with sheer physical force. However, a burst of light flashed, and the frost on Sheena's body was cast off to the ground as grey dust. Sheena opened her mouth slightly and spat out blood after freeing herself. She glanced furiously at the skeletal dragon through the mist of ice before flickering out of sight. Grim did not send Shadow Demon out to attack the ice dragon on such a chaotic battlefield. Instead, he kept Shadow Demon close by his side to protect him. Skeletal Ice Dragon Nax had clearly managed to assimilate the ancient reliquary to some extent. The fearsome power he possessed was no longer comparable to that of a fourth-grade creature. Standing out too much while fighting an opponent as powerful as this would risk drawing attacks towards himself. That was something that Grim absolutely hoped to avoid. That said, it was a good idea to demonstrate some degree of effort and contribution to the party. Grim waved his staff, and a hundred fireballs formed in an instant. They howled and crashed towards the skeletal dragon within the mist. The commotion and ferocity of the attack were so great that everyone's attention uncontrollably turned towards it. 
The skeletal dragon, who had just unleashed its breath and was surveying the room for any surviving enemies, instantly saw the fireballs. Two bright, chilling beams shot out of the mist and landed on Green. The next second, the mist burst apart. Nax charged forward with its mighty body, opened its maw, and snapped at Green. One was a giant, 30 meter long, 12 meter tall, and 50 ton skeletal ice dragon. The other was a mere human, 2 meters tall, and no more than 100 kilograms in weight. If these two individuals collided, the only possible result was the human's absolute defeat, crushed into the ground and turned into paste. Green wasn't so foolish as to clash with such a gigantic creature head on. He leaped away with fire teleportation and appeared in a different corner of the palace, a thousand meters away. The moment he appeared, he waved his staff and summoned a massive scarlet firestorm at the dragon's location. The skeletal ice dragon was simply too huge. Naturally, its size made it less agile. It had just turned around and locked onto Green's new position when the firestorm erupted, with it at the very center. A thick pillar of fire rose to the ceiling, its blazing flames engulfing everything within 300 meters. The extreme heat and flames ignited everything in their radius. Even the air and the ice crystals began burning. As a top-class fire adept, Green could freely imbue every single one of his fire spells with the corresponding fire laws. Of course, to injure a giant monster like Nax, fire penetration was necessary for each and every attack. Without the laws of fire, the most ferocious of flames could not injure Nax, even if they were to burn the dragon for several months. Only flames imbued with law power could penetrate the ice mist surrounding Nax and slowly inflict fire damage on its skeletal body. Of course, the damage being inflicted was minimal. However, Green wasn't Nax's only enemy. While the skeletal ice dragon was furiously chasing after Green, a large cloud of death energy and several unusual void runes landed on its body. Where the death energy spread, the ice crystals melted and the cold dissipated. The bones engulfed by the death energy instantly turned pale white. The dragon's bone spikes and ice force fields started to sizzle and turn black. The void runes were even more mysterious. They completely ignored the skeletal dragon's defenses and drifted into its bones, causing the ice energy in its body to turn volatile. If it wasn't for the terrifying ice force field in Nax's body, and his powerful spirit that neutralized part of the void damage, Chulas might have been able to scatter the ice energy in the dragon's body into terrifying chaos energy. Chaos energy was a vicious poison for any planar creature. The poison of energy. Nax reared its neck and let out a loud roar. A hint of pain could be heard in its cry. Four hundred years. It had been four hundred years since the last time it had felt pain. A group of bastards had broken into its place, injured its noble body, and were plotting to steal its most precious treasure. Nax could no longer suppress its anger at the thought of that. It wanted to use its merciless dragon breath to turn its enemies into ice sculptures and personally crush them to pieces with its body. Nax roared furiously. Blue light gleamed in its eyes as powerful ice energy immediately filled the entire palace. Once as hard as steel and smooth as a mirror, the floor of the palace began to shake violently and undulate as if a wave was passing through the ground. Ice spikes pierced out of the floor, instantly turning the hall into a sea of ice clusters. The towering clumps of ice took up most of the palace's space and obscured everyone's vision. The countless reflections from the ice surfaces disoriented the invaders, making it difficult for them to determine the skeletal dragon's genuine position. The mist of ice that filled the hall also had the effect of weakening and refracting spiritual senses. It effectively suppressed the senses of the invaders. This place was Nax's home field, after all. It couldn't be any more familiar with every inch of space in this palace. It knew every curve and every corner down to the very last detail. When everyone's senses were obscured, the invaders would lose their numerical and strategic advantage as a team, while Nax would be able to hunt them down freely. 
Sheena, who was the weakest of them all, was instantly on edge. Her hissing snake hair flicked their forked tongues, helping her watch over every possible direction from which the enemy could approach. She concealed her own aura and silently slithered across the ceiling. The forest of ice clusters beneath her was shrouded in mist. Tens of thousands of silhouettes moved between the ice crystals. It was impossible to tell which were real and which were only reflections, and even more impossible to tell where everyone's actual position was. Star Spirit Tula's body transformed into a cloud glowing with an unusual, dark light. He slowly merged with the ice mist and vanished without a trace. Grim laughed at the sight of this. Fire blazed around him as he vanished from sight, protected by the law of invisible flames. In the blink of an eye, Kanganas became the only person left in the room. Chapter 1265 Encircled Dragon God bloody damn it! If it weren't for the thousands of years of desolation and cold wearing away all of Kangana's emotions and feelings, he would be furiously cursing at these teammates of his. Damn it! He was a caster. If everyone was hiding, was he supposed to be the one to face that unreasonable dragon? Kangana's hadn't finished insulting his teammates in his mind when his soul fire trembled abruptly. Damn it! That skeletal dragon's here. His surroundings were still shrouded in mist and covered in ice crystals. Even as slender as he was, Kangana's would have trouble traveling through all the ice clusters. The forest of ice clusters was still as silent as before. The mist drifted quietly. Kangana's could not sense any change around him. However, even though he could not see the skeletal dragon's body or hear its footsteps, he could feel the dragon's unusual aura of cold thicken. It was so cold that even his soul fire shrank and shivered. Kangana's raised the short white bone staff in his hand without any hesitation. A cloud of death energy engulfed everything within a hundred meters, causing all substances within the radius to sizzle loudly. In particular, the ice crystals started to rot and turn black before crumbling into dust. Even the ice mist had lightened up faintly revealing what was around him. A hulking creature glowing with blue light suddenly appeared from the mist, roaring and charging at Kangana's. Kangana's waved his staff over and over. Several massive figures appeared, standing in the way of the skeletal dragon's charge. The first was a beginner fourth-grade bone dragon, accompanied by two beginner fourth-grade scourge knights and an intermediate fourth-grade greater lick. They could all feel the skeletal dragon's overwhelming aura of might, along with its devastating ferocity. If Kangana's had not forcefully commanded the bone dragon to intercept the skeletal dragon, it would never have done such a foolish thing. Unfortunately, as the soul-bound servant of a lick, sacrificing its own body to defeat the enemy was the only option that the bone dragon had. A deafening sound rang out as the two skeletal dragons of imbalanced sizes collided with each other. A force shockwave rippled outwards. All creatures significantly smaller than the dragons were uncontrollably lifted off their feet and blown away from the battlefield. The next second, shattered bits of dragon bone and dust-like shards of ice howled as they flew outwards. An odd crackling sound could be heard as the ice pillars nearby were hit and pierced by the shrapnel from the impact. Both Kangana's and his subordinate Greater Lick were also blown away. Only the Bone Dragon and the two Scourge Knights were able to remain on the battlefield. Massive shards of blue ice and ice dust settled to the ground and covered everyone beneath it. The violent force from the collision had shredded the surrounding space to pieces. Any spirit that extended into the battlefield was torn apart, preventing anyone from seeing the clash result. A bone dragon and two scourge knights against the skeletal ice dragon Nax. Even though both parties were fourth grade, the massive difference in power could not be made up for with mere numbers. A short moment later, the battlefield abruptly fell silent. A massive dragon skull was hulled out of the mist, sliding a hundred meters across the cracked ice floor before coming to a pause. The eye sockets of the bone dragon were empty. Its soul fire had extinguished. It was thoroughly dead. 
Meanwhile, the two Scourge Knights were still lost in the mist of ice and had not appeared yet. Considering the gulf in power, it wasn't hard to imagine their fates. Kanganas, who had drifted a thousand meters away, started shouting impatiently, Sand King, I know you've recovered. Help me stop this creature immediately, at this very instant, or our deal is off. It was only natural that Kanganas was so flustered. The fourth grade bone dragon might not be the strongest subordinate, but it was certainly one of his best and most elite servants. Now, it had sacrificed itself on the battlefield to absolutely no effect, along with two scourge knights. Even though he had lived for a thousand years, Kanganas felt the pain of this loss to his very core. These fourth grade undead servants were not common creatures that could be summoned en masse from the skeletal plane. In fact, many elite fourth grade servants were personally created by leiches with their exceptional necromancy and alchemical abilities. This process often consumed extremely expensive materials and gems. Losing even a single one of these servants would make Kanganas upset for days. The fact that he had lost three of them at once felt like a dagger in his heart. However, no number of servants, no matter how expensive, could compare to his own life. When it came to a moment of life and death, Kanganas would have no hesitation in abandoning them. Perhaps sensing the liquor's fury, Sand King emerged from the ground and once again stood in front of Kanganas. Kanganas was finally relieved now that a companion shielded him. He landed on the ground and started chanting rapidly with the aid of the fourth grade Greater Lick. They were preparing a powerful death spell. Energy rippled in the ice mist, and the roars of a dragon could be heard. It seemed like Nax was engaged in battle with the Medusa Sheena. It was a terrible and brutal fight. The next second, fire flashed inside the mist. Flames blazed as Green quickly teleported forward and threw a vicious fire core explosion into Nax's chest cavity. A hell of ice and fire. Ice magic was a branch of water magic, to begin with. That branch of magic had always had an adversarial relationship with fire magic. That was why even Nax could feel that soul-penetrating agony when the flames roasted its bones. Nax let out another cry that tore the clouds apart. The next second, clouds of blue mist chased after a humanoid flame, carving out an empty path in the palace full of ice clusters. As the fires burned and the ice resisted, a massive void array appeared on the ground where the mist was the densest. Endless void energy gathered in the air, covering Nax's mighty body with a layer of light. The next second, the void energy erupted. A portion of the ice energy in Nax's body was disrupted and reduced to chaos energy, causing it to lose control over part of its body instantly. Bastards, you damned bastards, I will. The skeletal ice dragon cried out furiously but was quickly interrupted by another series of violent attacks. The entire palace turned into a slaughterhouse as attacks rained down on Nax. Large amounts of ice energy spilled out of Nax's body, contaminating the nearby space and causing it to be incredibly chaotic. While his teammates occupied the skeletal dragon, Kanganas and his fourth grade Lick subordinate managed to cast their spell. A rain of gloom began to fall from the sky onto the palace itself. The already downcast skies turned utterly dark. Black clouds rose from the ground and soon covered the entire sky. The light was so dim that it was almost impossible to discern anything. Pungent rainwater descended from the skies. The stench was nausea-inducing, but what was even more terrifying were the red splashes that appeared on the ground where the raindrops landed. It was not any ordinary rain. It was a rain of rotting blood. As the evil rain of blood continued to baptize the palace, the mist of ice was worn away, revealing the battlefield in its entirety. The ice clusters were also quickly melting in the rain, giving everyone more space to move and dodge. It had only been five minutes, but Sheena was already badly injured from the fighting. She had no choice but to grit her teeth and bow out of the battle. Her once pretty body was now covered in bruises as well as blue marks left behind by the invading ice energy. 
Much of her flesh had succumbed to the ice energy and had shattered to shards of ice, leaving wide gaps in her body. It was fortunate that this place was as cold as it was. Most of Sheena's injuries were frozen, preventing a lethal loss of blood. Otherwise, given the number of holes that had appeared in her body, the loss of blood alone would have weakened Sheena tremendously. Her hair of snakes had mostly been frozen dead. The frozen snakes had shattered and turned into ice shards. Her long serpentine tail had also been severed in half. Even though what remained of her tail was clad in scales, it had still been inflicted with all sorts of cuts and gashes by the blades of ice and snow. Sheena slithered along the ground with her crippled tail. Every inch of movement made Sheena grit her teeth in pain. Meanwhile, Sand King, who was enduring all the pressure from Nax alone, was also in a terrible state. His thick carapace was cracked everywhere. Every time he clashed with the skeletal dragon, black insectoid blood spilled onto the ground through these cracks, staining the ice floor beneath them. One of Sand King's pincers had also been bitten off, while his proud stinger had been snapped in half, the broken part barely hung onto his body by some pieces of tissue and scale. In contrast, Grim and Chulas, who were spellcasters, were in a much better situation. They were constantly moving around on the edge of the battlefield. When they found the opportunity, they would teleport forward and unleash a devastating round of attacks. When the dragon seemed to turn its attention towards them, they would run away without hesitation. As for the honor and dignity of a fourth-grade powerhouse, that stuff was best left to the warriors. A rain of gloom from above, a rotting ground below, and several fourth-grade attacks surrounding it. The battle might be in a violent stalemate, but the overall situation was obviously in the invaders' favor. The combination of five powerful evil individuals. Even as mighty a skeletal ice dragon Nax was, it was difficult to endure such terrible pressure from every side. The battle was slowly starting to tilt in the invaders' favor. Chapter 1266 To Each Their Own Ice Dragon Nax was very mighty indeed. However, its power was still insufficient to deal with a party of five powerful fourth grades. The main reason the battle seemed so intense was simply because the members of the party were all holding back. They were cautious around each other and could not cooperate to the fullest extent. In all honesty, in individual power alone, Kanganas, Chulas, and Grim were just as powerful as the skeletal ice dragon. However, this was only a fun little hunting game for them. It would be nice to return victorious and with loot in their possession, but they could simply escape and return another day if they lost. That was why they consciously avoided all the opportunities to inflict grievous injuries upon the dragon that required them to be injured in some capacity. It was a party of strangers put together on a whim, after all. They even had to endure suppression from the planar consciousness of the chill frost world as they fought. No one would be willing to risk their lives in this battle. That was why this fight had dragged out for so long. However, the party's members were still powerful, after all. It didn't matter how the dragon struggled or fought with its life on the line. It could not escape its fate of defeat. However, what made Grim the most curious was the fact that Nax showed no signs of leaving its palace, regardless of how intense the fighting had become or how injured it was. The dragon remained rooted in the palace as it fought against the members of the party. Grim couldn't help but become suspicious of its behavior. Sand King, you don't have to keep fighting the dragon anymore. Dig your way to the heart of this place, and see if there's anything strange there. Grim teleported around repeatedly, avoiding the dragon's tackle and tail strikes as he shouted, I suspect the ancient reliquary isn't with the dragon, but. Grim wasn't communicating with mental messages. He was shouting these words. Upon hearing this, the members of the party paused for an instant. Even the skeletal dragon was stunned. The soul fire burning in his eye sockets jumped slightly. So there was something wrong with it. The members of the party immediately understood the situation when they saw the dragon's reaction. 
No wonder the palace had such an unusually cold aura. This aura wasn't the dragon's aura, but the aura of the ancient reliquary of deep winter. The ancient reliquary might possess powerful ice laws, but it also contained dreadful death laws. In truth, the reliquary was not a suitable origin artifact for Nax. However, for the sake of advancing to fifth grade, Nax had absorbed the ice laws in the ancient reliquary at the cost of its own body. That made its ice powers grow in power and devastation. However, the accompanying death laws converted it into an undead dragon, hated and despised by all living creation. The intense modification to its soul had made it much more powerful, but it also bound the dragon to this location. Before Nax fully completed its soul modification, it would not be able to take a single step away from the ice palace, much less fly freely in the skies like a proper dragon. As for why Nax didn't simply bring the reliquary with it. The reason was simple. It couldn't endure the terrifying and powerful principal powers within the reliquary at all. The evolution from law to principle wasn't just a change of terms. Laws were fundamental rules that a rule abided and functioned by. They were typically a small branch of a greater principal power. Take the fire principles, for example. They were an exceedingly large and complete system of power. Meanwhile, the fire laws that Grimm had grasped were only a small extension of this massive tree of principal powers. It wasn't until he gathered sufficient law powers that Grimm could peer into the principal secrets through his law powers. As for completely grasping a single principal power in its entirety, that was not something that a low-grade life form could possibly hope to accomplish. Their bodies would not be able to endure the strain. Fourth grad. These beings might be akin to gods or demigods in their own worlds. However, at their essence, they were no more than mortal beings. Their bodies and souls were all composed of material, planar substance. Since they had not broken free of the planar consciousness's limitations, they naturally could not ascend beyond the plane and execute the planar principles in place of the planar consciousness. The planar consciousness controlled all the principal powers within a plane, they would never hand over their authority to an outsider. Even those who were powerful enough to come into contact with the law powers could easily invite backlash from the planar consciousness if they crossed the line. As such, an ancient artifact containing two principal powers was of unimaginable significance to both Nax and Kanganas. That was why Nax became utterly horrified and furious when he realized that the enemy had become aware of the reliquary's true location. There was no need for any sounding of horns. With a simple sentence, Grim had pushed the dragon into a corner. It had no choice but to fight to the death now. Kanganas also had to put in some effort now if he wanted the reliquary. Playing it safe was not an option. Should the skeletal ice dragon force his companions back with desperate, reckless attacks, Kanganas would have trouble dealing with the dragon's ferocious attacks and frost breaths alone. Thus, the battle instantly began to reach a crescendo. The dragon no longer cared about the devastation of the reliquary's power to himself. He started to draw recklessly from the principal powers within the reliquary of deep winter. It converted that energy into an all-engulfing blizzard that devoured every inch of space in the palace. The battle had finally begun now. The party could no longer pull their powers in such a harsh environment. They could only fight on their own and await the moment when the reliquary's backlash struck the dragon. Either the dragon would cripple and kill them with this burst of power, or they survived until the dragon ran out of power and was consumed by the reliquary's backlash. It was a contest of their stamina and true power. No one could see or sense anything in the ice palace now. Everyone's spiritual senses had been suppressed to the limit by this chilling power. Even with their spirits as fourth grades, their spiritual appendages could not extend beyond fifty meters away from them. Such narrow vision pushed them to a precipice in this dangerous battle. A single mistake and their bodies could be shredded to pieces and their souls torn to bits. However, even as dangerous as it was, no party member chose to flee from the palace. 
It was simple, they didn't want to lose their chance to obtain the ancient reliquary of deep winter. Even though the ancient reliquary might not be compatible with their soul origin, and even though they had already promised Kanganas that they would help him obtain the dual attribute artifact, when the opportunity presented itself in front of them, everyone could have a chance to obtain the reliquary in a chaotic skirmish. Truly, who would give up on an opportunity to obtain an artifact? At least Green wasn't one who would give up on such an opportunity. At this point, it was everyone for themselves. No one could care less about the others. Green held the Tome of Corruption in his left hand and the Fire Coral Staff in his right. His entire body was shrouded in the crimson burning domain. Shadow Demon flickered in and out of sight beneath him, constantly on the watch for danger. Green walked forward without any hesitation, his skin-tight leather armor making him appear taller than usual. He passed his lips and looked around him with cold eyes. The skin on his smooth forehead split apart as a strange, diamond-shaped crystal appeared. Green's spirit became incredibly concentrated as it was fed through the focusing crystal. Tremendous fire energy surged out of the orb of the fire god and his heart of principles, gathering around him, blazing and eager. The moment he sensed the enemy's aura, Green would be able to unleash a devastating and unforgettable attack on them. As for injuring his party members, he he he, at this point, there probably wasn't such a thing as a party member anymore. Anyone that dared to approach him was someone with bad intentions. Green would not hesitate to strike. A violent shockwave rippled out from about 375 meters to Green's left. He could feel the energy aura of the dragon and Sand King through the shockwaves. Sand King's muffled grunt of pain could be heard through the mist and snow. Judging by the power erupting from the conflict, Sand King had been badly injured. He would probably be forced out of this competition for the reliquary. Just as expected, a sky-rending roar could be heard, and Sand King's unique aura quickly fled from the ice palace. Sand King was out of the equation now. Grim searched the palace in the mist, wondering to himself who the dragon's next target would be. Sheena, Tulas, or himself. Kangana's was a lick infamous throughout the universe. He would not have earned such infamy if this was the limit of his power. It was almost certain he had concealed his real power. Under such circumstances, if the dragon wanted a level playing field against Kangana's alone, getting rid of the other people was the best choice. If that were the case, then the dragon would either choose the weakest, Sheena, or... Before Green could finish his thought, the mist parted as the badly injured dragon roared and charged towards him. A frost breath was the first thing to greet him. A bright blue cloud of energy surged towards Green. The radius was so large and the temperature so cold that it was beyond Green's capabilities to detect the specific numbers. The chip's alarm started blaring in Green's mind. Chapter 1267A Flock of Freaks Beep. Warning. Warning. High energy low temperature particle stream surging towards host. The estimated core impact area will contain energy over 7,900 degrees in intensity. Impact radius is estimated to be 216 meters. Suggest that host conduct evasive maneuver immediately. Beep. Detecting unusual ice laws. The effects are unknown. Suggest that host immediately avoid the area. Chaos physique effect activated. Absorbed and converted 783 points of low temperature energy damage. Innate bloodline ability energy black hole activated. Transferring and neutralizing 1695 points of low temperature energy damage. Fire laws activated, neutralizing 3742 points of low temperature energy damage. Defensive fire force field activated, negating 630 points of low temperature energy damage. Elementium resistance negating 561 points of low temperature energy damage. Host will sustain 489 points of low temperature energy damage. 
A large cloud of ice energy surged forward and instantly engulfed Grim in blue mist as the chip continued to beep. The frost rolled forward and clashed violently with Grim's fire defenses and elementum force field. The blazing magical shields were frozen into ice shards in an instant. Even the ice floor beneath Grim's feet couldn't endure the cold. Frost rapidly appeared over the floor as the ice itself shattered. Even Shadow Demon, who was hiding in the shadows, was affected by the ice laws. A layer of ice crystals appeared on its metal body, and it almost seemed like it would be frozen dead on the spot. Grim's flowing sleeves immediately turned hard as steel. The frost started to spread from the corner of his sleeves, intent on turning him into an ice sculpture. The towering skeletal ice dragon roared and charged over. Should Grim be frozen in ice, he would probably be crushed to pieces by the dragon before he could break free. Compared to their dragon tongue magic, dragons preferred to end their battles in the most primal, violent way possible. Go, Shadow Demon! They had only just met, yet the ferocious old dragon had almost forced Grim into a corner. Thus, Grim didn't dare drop his guard. He shouted an order to Shadow Demon, all while the Tome of Corruption's pages flipped rapidly in his hand. Ugly whites filled with horrible plagues were summoned, one after another. These whites were mostly first grade and were completely useless on a fourth grade battlefield. The moment Grim summoned them, they were instantly frozen into sculptures by a passing cold wind. However, when the skeletal dragon thrashed past, these sculptures erupted, releasing large clouds of yellow poison mist, eroding Nax's blue bones and causing black spots to appear. Plague poison, damn it. This is plague poison. You bastard. How dare you release plague poison in my chambers. I will kill you. The infuriated dragon lunged forward, its blue jaws snapping at the quickly retreating Green. At this point, Green could no longer hide his powers. Emerald light flashed from the Tome of Corruption as Green was surrounded by a poison halo. The focusing crystal on his forehead glowed as bright as a star as his spirit violently surged into his fire coral staff. The disguised orb of the fire god began to glow brilliantly, emitting the prismatic radiance unique to ultra-grade items. The next second, all light in the room dimmed. There was only the radiance from the increasingly bright orb. The orb of the fire god was like the bright moon in the sky. When it appeared, all other sources of light seemed to lose their color. It was the only thing in the room burning with all its ferocity. Its temperature and brightness rose without stopping, it was, a sun. Indeed, the orb of the fire god was like a miniature sun descending upon the ground. It let off horrifying heat and light as its power continued to rise. Shock and horror appeared in Nax's blue soul fire as it charged forward. It could sense that the terrifying sun blazing in the young adept's hands was an ultra-grade artifact not inferior to the ancient reliquary of deep winter. What was scarier was the fact that the adept seemed to be able to control the devastating fire energy within that artifact freely. Nax could feel this miniature sun rise before it, all while it continued to approach like a moth to the flame. Nax let out a terrified roar and extended both blue wings to their limits. The dragon beat its wings with all it had and barely managed to kill its momentum. Nax's claws sunk deep into the ice beneath its feet ripping twenty deep ridges into the ground. However, just as its rush came to a screeching halt, Grim's charging attack had reached its peak as well. Grim waved both his hands together, and a tremendously violent stream of fire energy shot out of the orb of the fire god. The flames turned into a one-meter-thick pillar of fire that struck the skeletal ice dragon's body. The instant the pillar of fire struck, the dragon felt like it had been thrown into a terrifying, blazing cauldron. Every part of its body started burning furiously, from inside to outside. What was even more horrifying was the fact that this pillar of fire had also ignited the surging ice energy in its body. Even the ice energy was burning now. Nax reared its head and let out a roar of agony. It was no longer blue ice energy that surged out of its maw, nostrils, 
I suck its, and ears now, it was red, blazing flames. This single attack had injured Nax's very soul origin. The dragon retreated into the mist like a whimpering puppy. Kangana's was rapidly approaching the tall platform in the depths of the mist. All sorts of strange undead swarmed all around him. Because of these undead wandering everywhere, Kangana's managed to figure out the approximate location of the platform. However, while he gleefully snuck towards his destination, he abruptly stopped in his tracks and turned back to look into the mist. There, a thousand meters away, a terrifying energy aura was rising. It was so powerful that it had managed to suppress the ice energy that was everywhere in this palace. When he felt the traces of heat that pierced through the mist and the oddly searing consciousness attached to it, Kanganas couldn't help but become nervous, even as composed and cold as he usually was. Even though he was quite a distance away, and the chaotic ice energy was obscuring his senses, Kanganas still managed to identify the source of this energy aura in an instant. Gream, it was Gream, the human adept who called himself Fireman. Since when did he become so powerful? The last time they had fought in Morian Plain, he had over a 70% chance to kill Gream. It was precisely because of this certainty that Kanganas had boldly invited Gream on this mission to slay the dragon. However, judging by the energy aura he was radiating, Kanganas probably did not have any chance of winning. The appearance of such a powerful individual in the party made Kanganas nervous. He was no longer sure if his scheme would succeed now. However, Kanganas had no idea that even as he was shocked by Green's eruption of power, Chulas had already snuck onto the platform and was searching desperately for the ancient reliquary of Deep Winter. The instant Green's energy aura erupted in the distance, Chulas lifted his head from the magical runes he was analyzing. He also looked towards the distant battlefield. This power, Chulas couldn't help but brood in silence, even if they aren't a fifth grade, they aren't far away now. Did that human adept use some sort of explosive magical equipment, or was this his true power? Either way, we would have to be cautious around this fellow now. Due to his unique energy system, Chulas wasn't actually afraid of these same grade opponents of his. However, out of respect for an ultra-grade powerhouse, he had no intention of finding trouble for himself. Ultra-grade powerhouses. Those were terrifying individuals, even in the eyes of the star spirits. Never mind. Let them fight their own fights. He had best find a way to get the ancient reliquary in his hands first. Even Tulas felt excited at the thought of soon possessing an ultra-grade item. While the two powerful spellcasters were scheming their own plans, Sheena was cursing furiously in a corner of the ice palace. Bastard. 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 Kanganas, where did you find this absolute monster? I thought the ice dragon was a freak, but now, it seems like the real freak had been hiding by my side all along. Bastards. This battle is way beyond my level already. I can't stay here any longer, or I will turn into a stepping stone for those bastards. Sheena cursed angrily as she lunged at the edge of the mist as quick as lightning. The battle had escalated severely at this point. It was no longer a fight that a small fry like herself could be involved in now. If she insisted on staying here despite the situation, she would become the variable that all the competitors would focus on getting rid of first. It couldn't be helped. Only the most powerful individuals of the party had the right to obtain a powerful treasure. At the very best, the second and third most powerful could give it a try. However, the best a small fry like herself could get was some leftovers. However, the fact that the inconspicuous human adept was the largest raid boss hiding in the party was beyond her expectations. Sheena became nervous at the thought of all the cold words she had directed at the human along the way. She started to curse herself for her lack of foresight. Bastards. Bastards. All bastards. They are all so powerful, and they just want to pretend like they are the rookies. HMPH. 
I curse you all. May none of you leave this palace of ice. Sheena spat and slithered out of the ice palace in the blink of an eye. Chapter 1268 Hell of Ice and Fire The Ice Palace, on top of the mysterious platform. Star Spirit Tulas was still diligently analyzing the mysterious patterns carved onto the platform. However, he had no choice but to put this task on hold when he was halfway through. It couldn't be helped. The dragon had returned. The brutal battle between the fire adept and the dragon that Tulas had been expecting did not happen. Or rather, it was over too quickly. As a result, Tulas was now stuck on the platform as the dragon returned before he could find the entrance into the hidden passage. Even Tulas felt his heart quiver with sympathy when he saw the skeletal ice dragon emerge from the mist. It was in such a terrible condition. Ever since it forcibly converted itself from an ice dragon into a skeletal dragon, all of Naxa's scales and flesh had vanished. The dragon only had its steel-like skeletal frame and those horrifying massive bone spikes on its spine. What filled the space between its bones and its chest cavity was bright blue ice energy. The blue ice energy completely filled up the dragon's chest and skull, even causing strange, flickering ice runes to form on the bone surfaces. A layer of translucent ice crystals covered every inch of Naxa's bones. To attack Naxa's body itself, you would first have to penetrate its force field and shatter that layer of frost. It was only possible to injure the skeletal dragon if you were able to break through these two layers of primary defenses. However, while Nax remained within this frost-filled palace, it practically had a limitless pool of power to draw upon. It could freely use the devastating power of ice energy. This place was its lair and its home. No fourth-grade creature could possibly defeat Nax in this palace of ice while it possessed the ancient reliquary of deep winter. However, there were always exceptions. The only thing that could beat an ultra-grade artifact was another ultra-grade artifact. Nax, who didn't dare carry the ancient reliquary on its person and relied only on the ice energy within, naturally lost instantly against Green, who had two ultra-grade artifacts on him. Terrifying golden flames burned furiously on the dragon's body. It didn't matter how it beat at the flames or gathered ice energy, it simply couldn't extinguish the fire. Golden fire and blue frost clashed wildly over the dragon's body. They thrashed and rampaged wildly against each other, almost causing all the energy in the dragon's body to go into unrest. This once elegant, proud, holy, and magnificent skeletal ice dragon Nax was now half engulfed in flames and half covered in ice. The two unusual law powers fought with Nax's body as the battlefield, its life and energy as the fuel viciously lashing at the opponent. Meanwhile, with every clash, they exhausted more and more of Nax's already waning life force. Nax was practically blinded from all the smoke and fire. It stumbled its way back to the mysterious platform. What the dragon needed most at the moment was the aid of the reliquary. Only the pure and plentiful ice energy within the reliquary could put out the stubborn flames burning on its body. However, when it approached the platform, it instantly noticed that damned star spirit trying to decipher the magical protection array. Nax was on the verge of madness. Even though Nax had been badly injured by the fire laws, it still possessed its mighty strength and incomparable dragon tongue magic. It would never be afraid of a cowardly thief. Nax opened its maw, and a strange breath of ice and fire rolled towards the blue ball of light. Damn it! How did the dragon return so quickly? Tulas cursed to himself as void energy flickered in his body. Several void energy shields appeared in front of him, blocking the breath of ice and fire. It wouldn't have been much if the breath was composed only of fire and ice. These shields formed out of void energy could perfectly defend against elementum particles of any attribute. However, the two law powers attached to the dragon's breath were what was most scary about the attack. The laws wildly destabilized the void energy as they continued to tussle between themselves. The void energy shields shattered into stardust with a clear crack as the dragon's breath concluded. 
The next second, Nax opened its scorched maw wide and snapped at the star spirit's mysterious and beautiful body. Damn it! Law powers of two attributes, and two severely conflicting ones at that. Tulas didn't even have time to curse. His silhouette flickered as he teleported a hundred meters away, dodging the maw of the dragon. The moment it appeared, the skeletal dragon's equally burned tail lashed through the mist down from above. This place was Naxa's home field, after all. No trace of energy changes or disruptions could escape its notice. As Tulas didn't want to stray too far from the platform, he was immediately struck by the dragon's combo attack after teleporting away. Even Tulas could not react in time now. The slender, yet thick, dragon's tail crushed several newly formed shields and whipped Tulas on its cloud-like body. There were no sounds of cracking bones or splitting flesh. This ball of blue light was scattered by the terrible force, along with all the starry nodes within. The blue ball vanished instantly. When it once again reappeared, it was in the mist 500 meters away. The cluster of stars only managed to take shape after some difficult reforming and reassembling. However, the body of the star spirit had lost over half of its star nodes. The void energy that formed the shell of the body was also 30% gone. Damn it! Damn it! This is a terrible loss! Tulas propped himself up with much difficulty and said resentfully, My void circuits were scattered, and I've even lost 30% of my void energy. I won't be able to recover such losses without a hundred years of rest. Damn dragon! I will make you pay for this. Tulas started to mobilize his void energy as he cursed quietly. Soon, countless strange lights shot in every direction, and the star spirit's shining body disappeared into the mist again. Nax hurried onto the platform while Tulas was still routed. A strange array appeared when Nax's aura came into contact with the dense blocks of runes. This array completely engulfed the skeletal dragon. The dragon's soul aura communicated with the array of runes to conduct a series of verifications and confirmations. Finally, a pillar of light shone from the center of the platform. A small opening appeared on the platform's smooth surface and dense ice energy, so dense it had almost turned solid, surged out. The liquid ice energy broke down into dense mist upon coming into contact with the air outside. The fog spread outwards. Nax impatiently put his jaws at the opening, greedily absorbing this liquid ice energy. Strangely enough, the moment the ice energy entered its body, all of the golden flames were instantly extinguished. Blue ice energy was once again the dominant force in Nax's body. Even the dragon bones that had been exposed by the shattered frost were once again covered in an armor of ice. However, an unusually pale streak of death energy entered its body along with the ice energy. The addition of this death energy instantly caused the dragon's still powerful life aura to become weaker and duller. Its lovely bones started to turn black, then yellow, as the aura of rot unique to undead creatures crept further around Nax's soul. As a once proud and majestic dragon, Nax hated undead creatures with a passion. However, for the sake of more power, Nax had no choice but to abandon its pride and glory as a dragon and embrace its identity as an undead. For Nax, who viewed its glory as its very life, this decision was a huge blow to its soul. However, at this moment of life and death, Nax no longer had the luxury to hesitate. Nax inhaled violently, letting the ferocious ice energy and sinister death energy baptize its soul and turn it into a suitable host for the fifth grade reliquary. If no outsiders appeared, Nax could have dragged out this process over the course of a few hundred years. In doing so, the pain that its soul would have to endure could be spread out over the countless years. It no longer had time. It could only risk its own life to make immediate modifications to its body. The risk of a failure in modification had risen exponentially in doing so. Nax reared its head and let out a roar of agony. Its once bright blue body covered in frost was now rotting and falling apart at a visible pace. 
Ice energy and death energy were intertwined together as they sprinted throughout its body. It was almost as if the dragon had been infected by ink that was rapidly spreading all over, turning his bones brittle and black. Such a compound modification of both the soul and the body was a tremendous impact on the soul. An ordinary person would never be able to endure it. Even Nax, the skeletal dragon, could only howl desperately to express the indescribable agony it was suffering. The mist continued to ripple. Two figures slowly walked towards the platform, one from the right and one from the left. They looked at the roaring dragon on the platform, then at each other. Their eyes were filled with unconcealable greed and caution of their rival. I never expected how much of your power you kept hidden, Kanganas was the first to speak. It seems like you have managed to make the Libram of Wisdom submit. Otherwise, there is no way you'd have such tremendous power. His crimson soul fire swept across the tome-shaped equipment in Green's hand, his gaze filled with regret. If he knew the Libram of Wisdom was so powerful, he would have obtained it at all costs, even if it meant injuring himself to defeat this fire adept. However, it was too late to say anything now. The fire adept had obviously managed to subdue the Libram of Wisdom fully and turn it into his magical equipment. Obsessing over matters of the past was simply unwise. Chapter 1269 Persuading the Lick I let you have the Libram of Wisdom last time. You, won't be fighting with me over the ancient reliquary of deep winter again, will you? Kanganas asked with an unmoving expression. However, his tone was somber, even carrying with it a trace of caution. It couldn't be helped. The terrifying attack that the fire adept had unleashed earlier was too shocking. Even a creature as powerful as Nax had turned and fled, running all the way back to the platform to heal his wounds. Kanganas himself wouldn't have fared much better than Nax. That was why Green's attitude would be a decisive factor before Kanganas engaged the dragon in battle. He had no choice but to take that into consideration. That's an ultra-grade item, one with dual attributes. Don't you think you should compensate me somehow if you're making me give up on such a treasure? Green had pulled his hood behind his head now, revealing his young and handsome face. Golden flames burned within his eyes, a glowing crystal on his forehead, a heavy tome in his left hand, a strange staff in his right, and a fire force filled all around him. Shadow demon lurked beside him, phasing in and out of sight. Green was not moving a muscle, but all of these factors gave him a ferocious and powerful aura that engulfed the entire room. Reality always had the final say. True power was the ultimate bargaining chip in a negotiation. I can provide you with a small resource plane in exchange. The profit made from that plane is fairly impressive. I can guarantee an annual profit of two million magical crystals at the very least. Kanganas grit his teeth and put forth his offer. A small plane, two million crystals, Grim couldn't help but smile. If you think that sort of income is comparable to a dual attribute principal artifact, then how about I give you a small plane and the reliquary goes to me? Then three more fourth grade undead servants along with the plane. I can transfer the authority over their souls to you. You will instantly gain three fourth grade subordinates for your use. Kangana's soul fire was trembling as he made this offer. Fourth grade undead servants. Those were no common cabbages. Even Kanganas couldn't produce fourth grade undead at will. Creating a fourth grade undead didn't just require various high grade materials, they also needed complete, powerful souls. Once Kanganas had managed to obtain these materials, he would have a chance of creating a fourth grade undead through his exceptional necromancy skills. The undead created through necromancy and alchemy might not be as ferocious as wild undead, but they were more loyal and dependable. The cost of making such undead meant that even a lick of Kangana's power, despite having control over an entire skeletal plane, did not have more than ten fourth grade undead. Giving away three of them was as painful for Kangana's as cutting off his own flesh. 
it was pain that reached all the way to the bone marrow. If he didn't absolutely want to obtain the reliquary, he would never make such a sacrifice. As he appreciated the sorrowful expression on the liquor's white and smooth skull, Grim finally said, since you are so reluctant to part with your resource plane and your subordinates, I won't take them from you after all. Upon hearing this, Kanganas was shocked, and his aura started rising in response. Ah, you going to go back on your word to help me? I can consider letting you have the artifact, but on the condition that. That. You serve me for a hundred years. The crimson soul fire in the liquor's eye socket blazed furiously when he heard this. Even the two rubies that were embedded in his eye sockets couldn't conceal the flaring blaze of his soul fire. You are humiliating me. Human adept, even we lichers have dignity. Our soul is free. We will never be someone's servant. If you want to enslave a lick, you are welcome to try with all you have. It was obvious that Kanganas was very sensitive and stubborn on this matter. He looked as if he would rather die than bend the knee, prepared to fight to his death if needed. The service I'm speaking of isn't the enslavement of your soul. I am simply inviting you to be a guest elder at my clan. I guarantee that I will not make you do anything in these hundred years that would put your life in danger. All you have to do is register with my Crimson Clan as an elder, open up an undead branch in the clan academy and take in a few human apprentices. Of course, if any problems appear with the clan, you should help to the best of your abilities. Not only will I not touch any of your possessions or assets within these 100 years, but I will also provide you with the authority and resources that an elder is entitled to. How does that sound like to you? Acceptable. Kanganas looked at Grim as he smoothly offered his conditions. The lip couldn't help but be suspicious. Grim, what exactly is it that you want? I don't believe you are so kind as to help me. Grim seemed to be prepared for the liquor's suspicion. He casually replied, Kanganas, even if you obtain the ancient reliquary of deep winter, will you be able to completely assimilate it within a hundred years? The lick had obviously considered this question before. Kanganas replied without hesitation, impossible. It is a fifth-grade dual attribute principle artifact. Even with my power, a complete assimilate would take upwards of two hundred years. That settles it, doesn't it? Grim chuckled as he said, you won't be roaming around for the next two hundred years once you get the reliquary anyway. Why not come over to my clan and be a guest elder for the duration? You have so many high-grade undead under your command. Just send some fellow to deal with the whole academy and administrative side of things. You can find a secluded place and do your research in the meantime. Not to mention, the resources in our world of adepts have to be much more plentiful than that alliance of lichers you're in. You are free to collect any resources you require through the Crimson Clan's channels. This, is all the sincerity I can offer you already. Having said that, the flames around Grim started to grow in size. His entire body instantly transformed into a dozen-meter-tall flame giant. His booming voice was like rolling thunder, echoing in the ice palace for a long time. It seemed like Kanganas had sensed Grim's threat and felt his sincerity. His soul fire flickered, and, finally, he nodded silently. Good. If that's the case, then go. I will help you get the reliquary. Grim raised his staff without any hesitation and struck first. His target was not the skeletal dragon crouching over the platform, absorbing the artifact's power, nor Kangana's, who was completely on guard, but something in the distant mists. The mists were drifting lazily there, and the ice floor was as smooth as a mirror. There were no signs of enemies anywhere. However, as a pillar of fire erupted, several dozen void energy shields abruptly shattered, revealing the star spirit's cloud-like body. I will hold the star spirit back. You have thirty minutes to take out the dragon. If you haven't succeeded after thirty minutes, we will swap opponents. How's that? Green said. 
Kangana's hissed in reply when he saw the star spirit appear. Deal. The two of them spared no more words. Both of them drew upon all their power and attacked their enemies furiously. Bastard, star spirit Chulas shouted angrily as he scrambled and dealt with Grim's violent attacks. Fireman, what did the lick promise you? Why do you help him so? Tell me his offer, I will double whatever offer he made. All I ask is for you to stop the lick. How about that? Grim chuckled in his giant form, his willing to serve me for a hundred years. Are you able to do that? What? How is that possible? Tula said in shock as he dodged the fire spells, he, he agreed to those conditions. Fee, fine. I can serve you for a hundred years. Two hundred years. Kangana's furious cry rang out from a distance. Obviously, part of his spirit observed this area, even while he attacked the skeletal ice dragon. Two hundred years, that was not a short time, even for a fourth grade powerhouse. Leiches might not be truly immortal or eternal, but they could still live for a few thousand years. Two hundred years might not be much to them. They just had to bunker down and tolerate it and it would be over soon. However, two hundred years was a long and arduous amount of time for most other creatures. While Chula stuttered and wondered what to do next, Grim hesitated no longer. He pointed his staff at the opponent, and a ghostly green halo rose from the Tome of Corruption, instantly engulfing the star spirit's body. It was a poison halo unleashed with the aid of the fifth grade Tome of Corruption. Even though it wasn't at the level of poison laws, it was already a sufficiently terrifying attack against the unprepared star spirit. Chula's cloud-like body instantly turned into a sickly green color as the plague poison ravaged through his body. Even though the strange void energy killed most of the plague virus, the short conflict that had broken out in Chula's body was painful and damaging. An even more terrifying attack came next. Green bent down opened his mouth, and let out a breath of golden flames containing powerful fire laws. Tulas was in deep trouble now. For the first time, Grim had amplified this breath of fire with full lore effects with the aid of the orb, increased fire range, fire penetration, invisible flames, and fire's blast. Ordinary fourth grade adepts might have mastered several different elementium laws but assimilating the laws into their elementium attacks was very taxing on their spirit. A typical adept could usually only draw upon a single law power at any one time. An adept who could use two to three laws simultaneously was an elite without any doubt. Meanwhile, someone who could use four fire laws all at once like Green would be a feared ruler of their own world. The multiple fire laws compounded together formed a powerful cluster of laws that instantly affected star spirit Tulas. Chapter 1270 Tulas Feelings Elementium was not scary. What was scary were the principles. The high-grade creatures, their powerful elementium resistance provided them with basic elementium immunity. Ordinary fire, frost, and wind could no longer phase them. At the very best, these elements could only cause them a little trouble. The only things that high-grade creatures feared were laws and principles, the deeper applications of power that reached towards the origin of all power. They could never avoid the laws and principles, let alone reach the level of immunity. Thus, when two fourth-grade powerhouses made up their minds to battle, the first things to clash were the elementium laws in their possession. Fire and void energy. Neither was superior or inferior. They were both a part of the massive system of power in the multiverse. When the two forces clashed, the primary contest was between the caster's understanding and mastery of their respective laws, as well as their ability to move the principles using the laws as a lever. Green possessed an overwhelming advantage in these aspects. The void energy that star spirit Tulas possessed was undoubtedly an exceptionally powerful and unique form of power. It was mysterious and strange, its secrets mostly unknown to outsiders. Consequently, Tulas' offensive power was slightly stronger than Green's. 
However, in a contest of forces, power wasn't the only consideration. The auxiliary forces were also a deciding factor. Tulas might have decent high-grade equipment on him, but that equipment still fell incredibly short compared to Grim and his two artifacts. Of the two artifacts that Grim held, the Orb of the Fire God was used for offense and the Tome of Corruption for defense. The help that these two pieces of equipment provided him in a battle of laws was tremendous. The moment their law powers clashed, Tula's expression changed. An ominous feeling rose in his heart. Fire versus Void Energy It was the violent fire energy that possessed the absolute advantage in the clash. The flames crushed the void energy runes that Tula's had unleashed, and the fire laws instantly affected Tula's cloud body. The void energy shields shattered, and the void energy runes dissipated. The law fires ignited Tula's body and instantly started burning. Tula's void energy was not only unable to protect his consciousness core, but was even forcibly used as fuel by the surging fire laws. The flames started to spread and became impossible to extinguish easily. Meanwhile, most of Tula's desperate retaliatory attacks were dispelled by the law fires. What remained of the damage that got through was also endured by the Orb of the Fire God. Green was barely touched under those layers upon layers of defenses. The void energy runes that managed to reach Grim and enter his body were able to convert part of his fire energy into terrifying chaos energy. However, Grim had the Starbeast bloodline and was able to absorb such chaos energy. As such, the Star Spirit's retaliation wasn't even able to inflict as much damage as Grim's body was capable of healing. Some of these wounds healed in an instant the moment they appeared. They did not affect Grim's combat prowess in the slightest. One was powerful, and the other was weak. Both of them had used their most potent attacks, but the impact was remarkably different. The figures of the blazing humanoid and the blue mist slowly moved into the distance as they fought. The battlefield slowly moved towards the edge of the ice palace as the mists clamored with loud explosions and tremors. Even though their figures were obscured now, it was easy to imagine their battle's intensity and ferocity through the commotion rippling through the mist and the loud noises involved. Kanganas, who remained in the center of the palace, didn't dare slack off either. He could tell that Tula's was not Grim's opponent at all. As such, he had to finish off this already grievously injured dragon before Grim returned. It was obviously a tremendous challenge for him. The skeletal dragon was still a powerful creature, after all. No one would be able to gain an edge over it quickly. Time was life itself. Kangana started to fight with all he had for the sake of the ancient reliquary. As his deep, low voice chanted out the magical words, an undead dimension slowly opened once more. A new army of elite undead swarmed out from the portal and charged at Nax recklessly. An even more ferocious and savage battle broke out instantly. The rest of the party members had met up outside the towering and majestic palace. They each took up a space for themselves, far away from each other. They stared into the continually moving ice mists, the light in their eyes flickering. No one knew what they were thinking. The star spirit seemed to have lost all interest in what was happening in the palace. Stars glowed in his cloud-like body as he stared coldly at Green. Fireman, that's a fifth-grade dual attribute artifact. Are you not interested in it in the slightest? It was Sand King who spoke first. His body was still in poor condition, his carapace covered in cracks and blue frost. However, his spirit was mostly in good condition, and he still had over 60% of his combat strength left. So what if it's a fifth grade artifact? It isn't compatible with me. Even if I take it by force, I will end up in just as miserable a condition as the dragon. I will be turned into something that is neither human nor monster. I quite like my human body. I have no intention of turning into a monster with no physical senses. Green replied casually, completely ignoring Tula's furious gaze. Of course, you don't care. 
You already have two fifth grade artifacts in your possession, both of which are compatible with your innate attributes. HMPH. If you're so powerful, why don't you stop using your artifacts and have a proper fight with me again? Chulas was still upset at the situation. After the battle earlier, he thoroughly and finally understood all the aces up this adept sleeve. Sand King and Sheena opened their mouths wide when they heard Tulas reveal Green's secrets. They stared at this young adept in horror. They had already heard stories about the world of adept's powerful civilization, but they didn't expect that an adept from that world could be so unbelievably powerful. Compared to the skeletal dragon in the Ice Palace, this fire adept was probably the true monster here. Sheena, who was the weakest of them here, couldn't help but show a trace of worry on her face. Her tattered snake tail slithered slightly as she subtly put some distance between her and the fire adept. Even Sand King started turning his green compound eyes as he silently assessed this inconspicuous human. As powerful creatures from other worlds, their assessment of a creature's power was mostly based on whether that being possessed a powerful body and soul. They didn't really care too much for magical equipment or weapons. After all, most of their own worlds did not have power systems as complete or powerful as the world of adepts. They had only evolved into what they were after tens of thousands of bloody battles, emerging from amongst countless other creatures as the apex predators. They lived in odd, twisted but plentiful worlds, often possessing powerful talents in certain areas. However, the worlds they lived in often had very primal, backward civilizations, if they had any at all. In truth, this was the condition of most planar worlds. The powerful civilizations that currently existed in the universe had not come into being naturally. They had all been elevated to their greatness with thousands of years of development. Countless adepts had stepped out of the world of adepts, explored the boundless space, searched for rare treasures and resources, conquered innumerable planes, gathered all their essences, and brought them back to the world of adepts. This selfish act of raiding that they constantly committed empowered and strengthened the world consciousness of the world of adepts. The inclusion of foreign resources and knowledge systems allowed the world of adepts planar consciousness to grow continually. In doing so, it gave back to the power system of the world. Of the major planar worlds, the worlds that had a healthy and comprehensive cultivation system like the world of adepts along with proper alchemy techniques and rich resources were incredibly rare. Fourth grade beings like Sand King and Sheena from alien worlds were very likely the most powerful beings in their worlds. However, in the world of adepts, they were only at the level of elite fourth grade adepts. In fact, neither Sand King nor Sheena could be considered any of the best amongst the elite adepts. They only had exceptional talents in certain areas and aspects of fighting. That was why the two of them became cautious and fearful in front of this powerful fire adept from the world of adepts. They were no longer as bold or arrogant as they had been when they first met him. Meanwhile, even though Tulas believed himself to be just as powerful as Grim himself, he recognized and feared the two origin artifacts he possessed. In all honesty, it was because he didn't realize Grimm's actual situation that he had suffered such a terrible loss in their exchange earlier. Grimm nearly laughed out loud when he heard Tula's venting words. He couldn't help but reply, in the world of adepts, equipment is part of an individual's power. In fact, it's a vital component of their power. We human adepts do not have the natural physique of magical creatures or your different species' unique, innate abilities. What are we supposed to fight all of you with, if not with our equipment? You wouldn't ask the dragon to cut off its claws, its wings, and then pluck off its scales before you fight it, would you? Tulas fell silent. They had always been the strongest individuals in their home worlds. Now that they had stepped out of their worlds and witnessed the might of individuals from other planes, it was only natural that they would lose their confidence and become desperate. I promised you quite a lot earlier. Why did you not help me, but the lick instead? A short moment later, Tulas finally asked the question that he wanted answered most. 
because he possesses a force behind him, while you are only one individual. Green smiled. Putting aside the slight difference in your combat prowess, the benefits I get from helping him is much larger than what I would get from helping you. Tulas was once again silent. It seems like it settled, Sand King, who had been paying attention to the battle in the palace, suddenly cried out. Everybody lifted their heads and cast their gaze into the depth of the mists, 